Number 794, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart be
song to start off just a good constant reminder of how the Lord watches over us and uh, we happened to be watching TV last night and uh, this guy came on he had this t-shirt it was GGY6 I had no idea what that was so I you know I kind of looked it up for a minute and it was like uh, it, it stood for God's got your six well that still didn't help me because I didn't know what six was but uh, apparently, maybe some of you, if you have a military background, I guess, I guess six is apparently how they describe if you're going forward, it's 12. So to your right's three, to your left is nine, six is your back. And uh, so I guess the interpretation is God's got your back, uh, which, <laughs> which I uh, actually thought was pretty comforting. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's why it's important when there's somebody in the military, I guess, says, you know, they got your six. That means they got your back because you don't know what's happening back there. And uh, I, I think many times in life, uh, we, we, we kind of get through this life and things are happening and some stuff we realize. And there's a lot of stuff we don't realize. And uh, I think a lot of times because, uh, you know, it's behind us and uh, the Lord's just taking care of it. And uh, so I trust as you sing that this morning, you can sing because, you know, God's, God's got his eye on you and he's taking care of you. Even in the midst of some situations, we kind of, we kind of maybe don't feel that way at times. You know, humanly speaking, there are times where we, you know, we feel like we're, we're really struggling and. Uh, but but he's always there, and I'm certainly thankful for it. We're going to open in a word of prayer. Brother Dave, will you lead us in prayer this morning? Amen. All right, let's greet the folks around us.
right. Let's. Uh, I, I do want to mention, obviously, Brother Dave prayed uh, for his son. Most of you got the one calls, I'm sure. But just, uh, just continue to be in prayer for Matt. Uh, it's a real fine line they're dealing with between trying to dissolve some of the clots they have. And he had, the, you know, of course, the bleeders on the brain. And so this is a real balancing act. And we really need the Lord to kind of intervene there. Uh, and work there and most of you you know most of you have kids you know I, I, I'm reminded um, I'm reminded of the fact that you know sometimes when you have kids early on you think okay well you know I, I'll be like really responsible and worry about them till they're you know they're like out of the house and after a while I realized what we were expecting uh, when we were expecting Caleb we had my folks down and we were talking and uh, when I uh when I was delivered, I was like two weeks late, and they, you know, they had to go in and kind of grab a hold of me with a salad fork and, you know, haul me out. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, my early on baby pictures, I look a little like the cone head, you know, guys, because uh, it, well, my mom understood that. She was a nurse, and she knew everything was going on, but back then, it wasn't like the dads went into the delivery room, you know, they just kind of sat out there, and somebody eventually came and got you. So, uh, so um, they, you know, they eventually got dad and, you know, he could go in and see mom and he came in and I remember mom's telling this story and she says, you know, he, uh, he came in, he sat down, he was kind of quiet and she, she was all excited and she says, hey, did you, did you stop and see him? And he's like, yeah. And, and she's like, isn't he, isn't he great? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and she couldn't figure it out, and finally she realized he didn't understand what was happening. You know, he could just see that, you know, I mean, my head was, you know, abnormally long. And uh, so, but the funny part about it was, of course, everything was fine. I don't know what they did, smush my head for a while. I don't know what, they, I don't remember the details. I was kind of young, so. But uh, the thing I recall about it, though, is, and this was probably 34 years later, um, Mom's telling this story, and I look over at my dad, and, and, and my dad never cried. I saw my dad cry twice in my lifetime. I don't know what happened to me. It was a genetic thing. It skipped generations because I don't have any problem with crying. But my dad that really never did. But I looked over, and uh, he had this little tear coming down the corner of his eye. <laughs> and I realized at that point, oh, wow, this is a life sentence, isn't it? Like, you're going you know, to always... You can always be responsible for your kids. You're always going to have that regardless of how old they get, all those kind of things. But, uh, yeah, I'm just reminded. So please pray for Dave and pray, pray uh, specifically for Matt. Uh, when you got those things going on, you know, it doesn't matter how old they are. Uh, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're the parent. And uh, so, yeah, definitely hold them up in prayer this week. Read one missionary letter to you, and then we better get started in the lesson. It says, uh, dear friends and family, this is from the Hall family, uh, dear friends and family, so much to report on this month. We had just finished the first semester of Bible College, VBS, and had several groups visiting. We praise the Lord for another great semester training young preachers for ministry. Three of the young men actually finished their degree this semester. One is planning to start deputation in January in the hopes to get to the field of Mozambique. Some of you have met this particular student, Damian Ross. He has been a super faithful over the years uh, and has helped me in the ministry here. Uh, now he believes the Lord has called him to take the gospel to Mozambique. Uh, he will be trying to raise his support in South Africa, but if churches in the U.S. would like to support him uh, in this endeavor, it would, it, it would be money well invested. Uh, there's not a lot of solid churches that support missionaries for him to partner with on this side. So if any of you would like to be, uh, if any of you would like to, it would be great. Otherwise, uh, he would definitely covet your prayers uh, for the road ahead. Please pray for God to use all three of these graduates. Uh, we also are on the last day of VBS as I write this letter. Honestly, this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. Uh, it's an absolute blast. A few of my favorite things about the week are seeing the smiles on the kids' faces church brethren ministering together and souls being saved it is sweet sweet week at grace baptist church uh, we have so many workers at grace uh, it's really unbelievable for a small church our people have worked hard 
uh, and done a first class job of delivering the gospel packed week to some children that have probably never experienced anything like it. I don't have an exact number of salvations, but many have trusted Christ as their Savior. We do the children's VBS in the morning from 9 to 12. Then in the evening, we do a youth VBS from 6 to 8. Uh, it's a week long, but well worth the effort. I'll share one story with you. I've been trying to witness and invite my mechanic to church uh, for a couple months now. He hasn't come, but his young adult daughter, Kiara, who's 19, who visits him from time to time, came to our last uh, young adults meeting and then showed up at our youth VBS. She heard the gospel and my wife dealt with her the first night. Unfortunately, we were making too much noise playing games at that time and they could not hear one another very well. She came back last night and was counseled uh, with again by my wife. Uh, she comes, to a, comes uh, from a Roman Catholic family, but a few months back she was searching and ran across a Baptist preacher on YouTube, apparently pointing out the errors of Catholicism. She continued to question her religion, which caused her problems with her family. Uh, this is a big reason as to why she is not living with them right now. But as she continued questioning her religion, she came back uh, from Durban back to Port Elizabeth, 11 hours away, and came to our young adult meeting, then our VBS, where God has had witness uh, waiting to share the gospel with her. After asking a lot of questions, she bowed her head and asked Jesus to save her lost soul. What an awesome God. Please pray for Kiara as she grows in Christ and her lost uh, Roman Catholic family to be saved. Lastly, let me mention that there have been a lot of groups visiting uh, of late. Actually, in the last month, it has been, it has been a missions group after missions group. Uh, they have been all been a blessing to host uh, and have made an impact on the people here. Some of the pastors spent hours teaching our young pastors and preachers. All the teams spent it in each of the churches ministering in song, lessons, and messages. I also believe South Africa, the people, and the church have made a huge impact on these visiting churches as well. Doing our reasonable service, Kevin Corley, Clark Hudson, and Lana Hall. So I trust you pray for them. Uh, pray for the ministry there in South Africa. I know they would certainly appreciate that as they see folks saved and as people continue to grow in the Lord. And that's what we want everywhere. We'll take your Bibles this morning go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. We're going to continue on uh, lesson number 3 this morning uh, as we uh, study in the book of 2 Peter. And last week we looked at the results of having the godly characteristics described in verses 5 to 7 of the chapter. You know, the results would be that we would neither be barren or useless or unfruitful. Uh, and this lifestyle would bring glory to God. Then we also saw the strong emphasis that we were to always keep in front of us our salvation and the work that God has done in our life. I think that's real critical. Never, we want to never let a day go by without thanking the Lord for saving your soul. And realizing where you'd be without Christ at this point in your life. Never forget how much he loves you and the, and the work that he's done in your life. And then Peter emphasized serving the Lord and how he had a triumphal entry awaiting us because of what Christ has done in saving us. Not because of what Peter done, but because of what Christ had done. And then the last couple verses dealt with Peter stirring up to their remembrance and never letting them forget the, their salvation and their growth in Christ, which is kind of where he's at in 2 Peter here, trying to teach them how they grow and begin to really found themselves, build themselves upon the word of God. And he'll continue this until he died and left his tabernacle behind or his body as he talked about. So this week we're going to shift the basis or the grounds uh, for their belief and why we can be certain uh, of what we believe and why we believe it. How, do we, how are we able to be confident in those things? So if you look there in 2 Peter chapter number 1, let's read verses 15 to 21. And we'll finish out chapter number 1 this morning. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse number 15. It says, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, 
when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's open this morning in a word of prayer. God, we're just uh, grateful, Lord, for your love for us. Thankful, God, that, Lord, we know when you save us, you begin a work in us that you want to continue until you take us home. And we're certainly grateful for that. And, Lord, we're grateful this morning for your word. God, we're thankful for its preservation, for the writers of your word that you used. And, God, we're just thankful God, that we can have a copy of and in our language that we can read and study and memorize and and, and know it, Father. And Lord, I just pray this morning as we get through your lesson that you'd use this word in your spirit, God, to work and to move in our hearts, to teach us and to grow us, and God, uh, to challenge us if needed. And God, we're just grateful, Lord, for the time we could spend together here this morning, God, for it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so point number one, we're going to talk about the grounds, of, uh, the grounds of belief. The grounds of belief. And right under that is the experience of the transfiguration. The experience of the transfiguration. Now, Peter begins here, he says, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. So, He sets a general thought here that he wants to leave them with something that will continue to stir them up in remembrance long after his departure. You know, he's not desiring that he, you know, that that it's just a temporal thing here, but he really wants to teach them in such a way that they begin to grow and, and, and that they'll be able to carry this forward long after Peter is, you know, Peter is gone here, deceased, as he says. You know, this thing he would leave them is the very books that we have been studying, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. You know, as the Holy Spirit wrote them and and Peter wrote these words uh, as the author here, we see these books he wants to leave them. So it's a record that they can begin to reference and use in in days to come. In your outline, rather than just uh, going to them and verbally telling them of Christ, Rather than just going to them and verbally telling them of Christ and his works, he would instead write these challenges down as God would direct. He would write these challenges down as God would direct. And that was exciting for Peter just to think about, because sometimes you can can tell people. Sometimes people uh, are very good about sharing uh, maybe family stories. And and, and sometimes we... uh, you know, sometimes we share those stories verbally and, you know, people like to, I always liked as a kid to sit around and listen to, you know, the older people talk about these stories, whether it was family or whatever. And I don't know how the story relates or changes over the course of time, but, you know, but the stories I always like to hear, what happened and those kinds of things. But, you know, but many times after a while, you know, you think like, I, I, I sort of remember that or I sort of remember this fact that I remember somebody talking about. But unfortunately, at this point, many of the people that I would go access or ask about it, they're no longer here. I mean, they, they've gone on. And, you know, and at this point, Peter, I mean, obviously wants to share with them verbally where he's at. But I think he's excited here in the fact that, listen, it's going to be written down, and that, that writing can be preserved, if you will. And, and, and he's excited for the admonition that's going to come and how they can continue to access that word and continue to be able to read the admonitions he has. And hopefully that word would continue to stir them and make them desire uh, to be serving Christ. 
you know, the wording in this verse paints kind of an interesting picture of how, how, viewed or, how Peter viewed his departing or, or his death. You know, he uses the phrase, after my decease, to describe his death. Now, sometimes we say the, the deceased, you know, it, it, and that word is it's kind of a common word that we may use. In your outline, the word for decease is the word exodon. The word for decease is the word exodon, which is a word used for exodus or departure for a journey to another place. It's the word used for exodus or departure for a journey to another place. So as Peter describes this, he says, listen, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this, you know, that you may be able after, after I've departed for my journey to my next place. Obviously, Peter was talking about his, his home in heaven, but he was excited that even though he would be moving on in this journey, they would remain and this word would remain with them. This word, is that, that word uh, exodon there, it's only used two other times, uh, with one being Luke 9.31, dealing with the, the transformation, which we're going to deal with in a, in a little later here. So it's interesting he references those things. So Peter here, he seems to be consistent with the theme that he's talking about. He, he's staying pretty consistent in the theme that he's trying to to do here he talks about his tabernacle or the temporary housing for his spirit and we know that happened uh, i think in last week's lesson he referred to that tabernacle being just again that temporary uh place where the spirit was residing and how he'd be putting that off to go on this journey for another place so he he has this common theme and we know and we've talked about this book of second peter is really the last of peter's writings as he kind of heads at some point, we know, uh, to passing from this life. But he, he, he sets these things in order. And he was not saying that he would cease to be. He wasn't telling him, listen, when I go away, I'll, I'll no longer be. But he would simply be moving on in the journey God had set before him. So death wasn't an end point for him. Death was an entry to the next phase of the journey with God and his eternal home in heaven. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we don't live this life in whatever time we have. You know, when we die, we're done. There, there's nothing beyond that. I'm thankful that God has a journey for all of us, and we want to be prepared for that uh, as, we, as we pass from this life at whatever period of time that may be, whether that's seven years or 70 years or whatever the case may be. God has this journey ahead for us, and that's kind of where Peter's uh, talking about here. You know, we need to always ask ourselves the question, are we, are we preparing for our journey? And again, that's a question that we don't necessarily, although we sometimes tend to think about it a little more as we get further down this temporal road that we're on. We maybe think about that a little more, but actually the preparation from that journey should be a lifelong thing. That, that we're preparing someday to, to move on to that next phase that God has for us when he's ready to take us home to be with him. So we see that kind of in verse number 15. He kicks off here this idea that he's excited about after his departure here that, that he would always they would always be able to read the word of God and it always would be able to stir them up or to stir up in remembrance. Then he gets on to verse number 16 and he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know, they, they were not trying to pass on clever stories passed down through time. You know, the, these weren't interesting and, and, and interestingly inspired stories that he wanted to make sure were shared with people. But the claims concerning Christ would be validated. And that's really what he's saying here is, listen, these are not, these are not interesting stories. The, these are facts. These are validated facts. And I can validate those personally myself. You know, they made known the power and the coming of Christ. And that was important for him to understand and to, and to share. And remember, Peter got to see you know, a, a lot of things done by Christ in his walk with Christ, being in that kind of inner circle, if you will. 
He'd seen Christ do all kinds of things through the power of God working through him that, 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 that you know, many people would not have seen. And yet he was, you know, he was blessed to be able to understand those things that were happening. You know, we could look at example after example of demonstrating the power of Christ and certainly many witnessed his coming in his presence. And we know that even from his departure. You know, it names people that, that saw him after the resurrection. And even at one point, it names a group of up to 500. So these events weren't things that were just fairy tales, that somebody wrote an interesting story, that this legend of Christ became greater over the years. Peter's saying here, listen, these things are validated. They're fact. And, and, and there are lots of witnesses that can talk about that. Now, obviously, later Christ will come back in power to rule on the earth, but, but he could validate those things that he had seen in Christ's departure. And then finally, Peter closes out the thought here in verse number 16 by saying that they were not, uh, not only were these not fables, but again, they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Peter could speak to that personally. In your outline, these were firsthand accounts. These were firsthand accounts and not some stories passed down through the years. They were firsthand accounts and not some stories passed down through the years. And again, like, you, you know, if you have family stories that people recall, it, it, it probably was a lot better if the person was actually there. You kind of knew exactly what it was. If, you know, his grandpa told somebody else that told somebody else, you know, then, I don't know, maybe the stories were, were a little better over the course of years. I'm not sure. But, but Peter's really saying here, listen, these, these aren't these cleverly crafted stories. These aren't things that people have refined over the years to make Christ be. He's saying, listen, they're, they're eyewitness accounts to it, and I've witnessed it firsthand. Verse 17 and 18, he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So verses 17 and 18 here refer to the account of the transfiguration that we talk about. Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8 just so we kind of go back and we ground ourselves in it. Because Peter, you know, Peter's uh, using this as a basis for what he says. So I think it's important for us to go back and read it and remember it. Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 8. He says, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. It was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there, there appeared with them, unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make thee three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when they touched them, and when... No, I'm sorry. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and they were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. So, you know, we read this story and I, I, I'm always kind of reminded, you know, with Peter. Well, Peter and my personality are not exactly the same. Uh, you, you know, I, I think we sometimes give Peter a bad rap. And so, but you see the characteristics of who Peter is. And sometimes I think probably, you know, probably like all of us, Christ loved it in some cases, <laughs> in some cases. You know, so, so here we find, you know, he he's, he's gets to be a part of this transfiguration. And, and, and we know Peter's, Peter's a doer, right? Peter's, you know, he, he wants to go do things. You know, if, I, if it's time, I'm going to jump in the water and I'm going to go. Or, you know, I, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to take something and go with it. 
And we find Peter here in this situation. You know, he's part of this group. He's, he's watching this happen. He sees Moses and Elias. And, and, and Peter, you know, his, his personality, his instinct is to go, go, do something. Hey, let's, <laughs> let's build some tabernacles. Let's get these things put up. Let's build some tabernacles. And he's going on about the plans he has. And he's excited about what happens there. And God kind of says, hey, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You know, he, he kind of has to remind Peter, okay, just, uh, just you know, don't, don't try to do anything. Just, just listen. Just, just, just soak it in, so to speak. And, you, you know, when, they, when the disciples heard these words and they heard the voice of God, they, they fell on their face, you know, and they were, and they were, they were afraid. And, and listen, I, I think you and I could have no idea what that would be like. But we find here that that happens. But, but yet Christ comes over and he, uh, you know, he wants to assure them. He doesn't want them to be afraid. He comes over and he, he touches them and he says, look, arise and, and be not afraid. Get up. <laughs> Let's, you know, I, I mean, I've, I, I've had you here for a purpose because I want you to understand the, the power that happens here and the things that, that God is capable of doing and, and, and that the Lord is using me to do. You know, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they, they, they saw no man just, just save Jesus only. And, and, and we see that kind of called out here uh, in, in this account of this transfiguration. So it's interesting when we go back to Second Peter then, again, it says there in verse 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice from him to the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and when we were with him in the holy mount. So again, he's reinforcing to the people, listen, what I'm writing to you, these aren't, uh, you, you know, this isn't my best work. This isn't my novel. This isn't a great story that I came up with. This is an eyewitness account of what happened and, and what God had done and the power of God working through these situations. You know, and we see here that, you know, they, they were, you know, no doubt this was probably the, the greatest experiencing of the presence of God and the power and the glory, I, I, I think, to be revealed aside from maybe Moses' experience with the burning bush. You know, probably those two are very similar in some ways. So, so this experience that Peter has, it, 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 it's something that there aren't a bunch of people walking around saying, yeah, I've been in the presence of the Lord. I've seen, I've seen this kind of power before. So he gets to be that eyewitness account. Even though he writes a couple books, he's not certainly not as, you know, not uh, used as much as Paul is in some of the writings in the New Testament. But yet he's got a critical element to share with the church here what had happened. And your outline, not only did they see the transfiguration before their face, not only did they see the transfiguration before their face, but they heard firsthand the Father's response to claim His Son, the Messiah. But they heard firsthand the Father's response to claim His Son, the Messiah, and to place a seal of approval on all that He had done. On all that he had done. You know, then they're commanded to hear what he would tell them. So, you know, we know the Bible tells us that when it talks about Christ, it, it says of Christ, he did always those things which pleased the Father. You know, where are we to have that same kind of attitude that we want to always please the Father? We're not going to get there this side of glory. But Christ is able to do that. And then we, we move on now. So he sets the basis. He tells them what's going to happen. Listen, I'm going to be moving on. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be taking this exodus. I'm going to go to the next part of my journey. But I'm excited that you're going to have this to reference. Not a story I'm going to tell you. It's the word of God that I'm going to give to you. And we're going to write it down so you can reference it. And, and, and future generations can reference this. And by the way, what's written here isn't some kind of story that's been concocted, but these are writings that are coming, and I've experienced the power of God in my life and the presence of God in my life through some of these situations that you can count on 
what is being written here. Now, as we move on to the last three verses of the chapter here, we're going to see, see Peter gives an indication here that the prophecies were more the you know were a more sure account than the transfiguration and miracles that he had experienced. So what he's writing is even a more sure thing than what he experienced in things. And that's important because there are people sometimes that they read the word of God and they have a certain experience in life and they elevate that experience over what God's word says. And, and we got to be very, very careful about that. You know, to never elevate our feelings or our experience above what the word of God says. And he He's setting that tone in that situation as he's going through here. You know, the word of God should be really the foundation for everything that we believe and should be the basis for all we do as well. So this is really, and that's what he's trying to teach them. So again, back in 1 Peter, he, he's, he's telling them trials are coming, hang on, you know, you know follow Christ, be faithful. We get to 2 Peter, he says, great, you've now experienced two, three years of, in some cases, really horrific trials, and, and you've made it. But oh, by the way, there's more to come, and, and, and the way you're going to make it is not necessarily just in your own, you know, in your own uh, will, so to speak, but you need to build your life on the Word of God. So when you face these next things that are going to happen, you can have a confidence. You can have a basis for making a decision or setting a path in your life because that's, what the, because that's what the Word of God tells you. And you can be confident in that. So he's trying to get them to that point of building their life on the Word of God. So 2 Peter 1, look with me at verses 19 to 21. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy... Again, more sure meaning that it, 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 it's even more sure than this transfiguration account I told you about. He says, Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So in your outline, we're to take heed to the word of God. We're to take heed to the word of God. And we do that by reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on it. And again, all those things are ours to do. It's important for us to read the word of God. It's also important for us to study the Word of God, to spend time. Most of you have some type of study Bible. You know, frequently those study Bibles, if you go to a verse, it'll call things out and it, it'll give you other verses to reference. You, know, you may not be a Greek scholar. You may not be a Hebrew scholar. Probably nobody here is. Maybe, maybe pastor pastor has some experience in it. I, you know, I certainly don't. Probably most of you don't. But we can definitely, one of the best things we can do in studying scripture is to compare scripture with scripture. So, you know, when we say study, it doesn't mean that you have to go to a university and get a degree. It does mean, though, that you spend time comparing the word of God. And we have such great helps that you can do that. You can read that verse and then go, oh, well, this says John chapter whatever. And you can flip over and read that. And somebody has done some, some work and some help in our case to, to help us understand that. So it's important that we, you know, we take heed to it, that we read it, yes, that we study it, that we memorize it. You know, it's important. I mean, the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart. Why do we do that? That I might not sin against God. So the purpose in us memorizing the word of God is not that we can necessarily... Uh, quote it publicly. It's not so people go, wow, man, that guy knows like so many verses. Or that lady knows so many verses. But listen, most of the time, or many times in your life, you're not going to have your word of God with you. You're, you're probably not carrying it in all aspects of your life. 
You know, but when we memorize the Word of God, we have it with us. Now, some of you may say, and I, and I will candidly say this, it is not as easy for me to memorize things as it once was. And most of you are probably going to say the same thing. It just doesn't, it's not quite as elastic as it used to be. But I guarantee you, if you'll spend time working at it, uh, God will bless it. Now, you may not stand up here and quote chapter after chapter by memory. I mean, I see some of the young kids, and I've seen Bible competitions where, you know, kids like, you know, memorize whole chapters or sometimes whole books. And, you know, and, and maybe you're not there now. That's okay. But I think, you know, but I think working on memorization of the Word of God, if nothing else, working on a verse over the course of time and, and, and meditating on it, It'll help your understanding, and God will bless it. So all those things are important that we, you know, that we have happen, uh, that we want to, you know, we want to read it, we want to study it, we want to memorize it, we want to meditate on it. Um, it's also important to hear it, it preached and taught. But that's not to be the whole intended purpose of your only input. You know, if the only time you get something out of Scripture is when you come you know, to the preaching service, it's not exactly what God desires. I mean, it's okay, but, you know, and it's important for us to do that. But if you're really going to grow and the Lord's going to individually work and speak to you through His Word, you've got to spend some time in it, you know, on your own, and, and that's important for us to do that. So the Word of God is really like this light that shines in a dark place, and that's what He's saying in these verses. You know, this lamp's not meant to light... You know, your entire surrounding, it's not meant to be the sun, you know, but it's intended to shed light on your immediate vicinity. So in your outline, in this case, the prophecies concerning Christ, the prophecies concerning Christ were not totally revealed, but light was shed on them. But light was shed on them. Now this light is sufficient until the day dawns. It means that when the events of prophecy occur, they'll be much brighter and understood than the lamplight that's given to us now. And then in your outline, the last phrase refers to Christ as the day star. The last uh, phrase refers to Christ as the day star, which is a reference over to Revelation twenty two sixteen. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So then Peter finally gets into an understanding again of how Scripture came about and ensures them for the basis for it. So in verse 20, he assures them that no Scripture is of any private interpretation. This simply means that God didn't, didn't present the information of Scripture to the prophets or to the writers, and they looked over the information and decided what to put in or how to write it down. That's not how it worked. It was not a private interpretation. But in your outline, in verse number 21, we are told that the prophecy or word of God came not through the will of man, came not through the will of man, but under the direction of God through the Spirit. Under the direction of God through the Spirit. So these holy men spake as they were moved, as the phrase there, uh, as they were moved, has the idea of a, of a ship being on the sea, kind of being moved by the wind. And in the same way, the prophets only spoke when they, when they were moved by God to say what they did. It was not their, their own, it was what they spoke as God gave to them. So it's important we understand that and have confidence in the Word. And we could spend weeks talking about, foundationally, the confidence we can have in the Word of God. But that's all we're going to do this morning as we touch base. Let's uh, go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, thanks, Lord, for your love. Thank you, God, for your working in our life. Thanks for your word, God, that we can study it, memorize it, know it, Father. And, Lord God, we just pray you bless the preaching of it as we get into the next service, God. Just use it, Father, in a real way, God, in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.